Thank you so much for joining us at LifePoint Church Online. If God is using this ministry to impact your life, we would love to hear about it and encourage you to share your story at lifepoint.org forward slash story. If you'd like to partner with us financially and help expand our reach all over the world with the good news of Jesus, you can do so by clicking the Give button at the bottom of the page and selecting the option that works best for you. Or you can use our text to give option by texting the keyword life point and the amount to the number 45777. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Today, just because I love you and I'm a good pastor, I brought a great friend, a family member into the house. Pastor Clayton King is with us this weekend. And if you're new to LifePoint, he's like family around here. Um, he's one of the pastors at New Spring Church in Anderson, South Carolina, with campuses literally all over the state, not just figuratively, literally 16 campuses, I think, all over the state. Um, he's the founder of Clayton King Ministries, Crossroad Camps, where our students, 6th through 12th grade, go to summer camp, and they come back changed every summer on fire for Jesus. And we're just so grateful for his ministry and he and his wife, Shari, and their whole team. They do so much. Be praying for him. Listen to this. December 31st, he'll be preaching in Uganda to 140,000 people in person and 30 million on TV. So the opportunity... The opportunity for the gospel is huge. And so pray God would just give him the exact words to say. Pray protection over him. Um, he's actually going as a diplomat, which is kind of cool. So he's got some protections there. That'll help him out. Um, but pray spiritual protection over him and his family and that God would give him the words to say and that we'd see the greatest harvest that he's ever seen in his ministry. Um, in that season for the glory of God. Um, and he's got a book at every campus. I, don't, I think I haven't got reports on how many are left. Sometimes the earlier services buy out everything. And um, sorry for you, you can go to amazon.com. Um, but I want, there's in every campus, every four year, his book, Overcome, it's his latest book. And I want to encourage you to pick it up for yourself. The best investment you make is in your own soul. And then the investment you make in the lives of others. And uh, so this is better than an ugly sweater you're going to get, those bad ties and socks. This is a better investment. Can I get an amen? Everybody agree? So pick one of those up. Why don't you get on your feet? Come on at every campus. We show honor in this house. Every campus up on your feet. Welcome Pastor Clayton King. What's up, Life Point? Welcome to church today. What a great day to be in God's house together. You know, hey, while you're standing up, before you sit down at every campus, uh, I want to let you know, 30 years in ministry for me. I just turned 45. I uh, still play an hour and a half of full court basketball two days a week. And play, because and and, you can't foul out an old man basketball. You can hit as hard as you want to. But one thing I've learned in 30 years of ministry is um, pride is like bad breath. Everybody else knows you have it, but you. <laughs> Humility is the same way. Humility is something that everybody around you can see in you, but you don't know that you're humble because as a humble person, you're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about everybody else. And I'm saying this because it's true. I've never known a more humble man I've never known a more humble pastor than Pastor Daniel Floyd. He is a man among men in ministry. I've, I've never known a more genuine pastoral couple than Tammy and Pastor Daniel, how they shepherd and lead this church and this move of God. And I want to tell you, because I'm a guest in your house today, but I'm also a member of your family, you guys are the gold standard. Shari and I aspire to love each other like the two of you love each other and to serve the church like you two serve the church together and to be an example of pastoral care and integrity. Tammy and Pastor Daniel, thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for how you lead. I mean that. Glory to God. And hey, before you sit down, I want to honor someone else. I want to say in 30 years of ministry, I've never met 
a more excellent or effective student director than Alicia Hensley. She is fantastic. We've been able to work with your students at our Crossroads Summer Camp, and, and, and Alicia, as a student director here, she really is the gold standard for student ministry. Uh, we had your students at our summer camp the last several summers are coming back again this coming year. Alicia is going to be writing for our magazine that our ministry edits and controls, a magazine called Youth Worker Journal. And I just want you to know you have one of the best leading your student ministry. So thankful for Alicia and for her husband and for their children, their family. And I'm glad to be back today. I've only got three hours to preach this sermon. So would you high five everybody you can reach and say this is going to be a great experience. And then you can have a seat. What a day we get to experience together today. I want to bring you greetings from the great state of South Carolina, home of the reigning NCAA national champion Clemson Tigers. I thought I would get a better response than that. As a Dallas Cowboys fan, it's good. It's, it's good to have at least one team that wins every once in a while. I also want to bring you greetings from New Spring Church, where I serve as, as a pastor there. I also greet you from Crossroads Summer Camp. This summer, your students came. We saw 1,100 decisions for Christ this summer, 22 years of summer camp ministry. When LifePoint Church shows up at summer camp, you change the atmosphere. Uh, we've been able to raise $1.2 million and give all that away to missions overseas, and we're really excited to have your students back with us this coming summer. I also wanted to tell you hello from my lovely wife, Shari, and both of my children. They are serving right now as I speak back at New Spring Church. Uh, they all three volunteer, and I get to be here in this house today and get to experience the goodness that is Life Point. You are my favorite people in the world to preach to. You're so easy. Easy like Sunday morning. Ah. Y'all don't know nothing about Lionel Richie up in this house, do you? <laughs> or a white guy trying to sing Lionel Richie on a Sunday morning. Come on. I want to take you to a place in Scripture today that I hope will be an encouragement to you as we get ready to enter into one of the most effective times of year for us as a church to reach unchurched people and to see people who are far from God meet Jesus and begin a relationship with him. The Christmas season is the most effective time for you as a part of this church to invite people and to bring them with you to a Christmas experience. Statistics tell us that people are more likely to come to church during a big holiday season, Christmas being the primary one, than any other time of year. Statistics also tell us that a person who doesn't go to church or doesn't go to your church or may not be a Christian, they will come to church if they are invited by a personal contact or friend, and they will come, by and large, after the third invitation. So you've got an entire week now to begin to pray about and to begin to seek out people that you know and love, that you care about, that need to know God loves them that need to know they have a heavenly father who sent his only son so that they could have a brand new life and reach into the future and take hold of their destiny and live a life of purpose that counts and matters for something. Do not miss out on an opportunity to capitalize on and leverage Christmas because God has given you an anointed pastor and he is going to preach the word and your job is not to stand up here and do what Pastor Daniel does. Your job is to Look around the landscape of your life and see who is there at a cubicle in your office space, sitting beside you in a desk at school, living in the cul-de-sac or in the same neighborhood as you, living in the apartment complex below you, beneath you or beside you, the guy that delivers your packages from Amazon.com because praise God, if you got Amazon Prime, shipping is free this year. <laughs> West Side, what's up? Right? Somebody's coming to your door to, deli to deliver a package. Someone's taking your order at the restaurant. Someone's bringing your food out and handing it to you. You are surrounded by opportunities to step into your gifting and your ability to invite people here so they can hear the greatest story ever told, how God loved the world enough to send his son to save us from our sin and give us new life. So I thought it would go ahead. If you want to clap, don't patty cake with me. Let's go all in. 
So I thought we would go to a pretty familiar story, at least in American culture, the story from Luke chapter 2 about the shepherds who were the first people to receive the news that Jesus was born. Now, of course, Mary and Joseph knew. Of course, uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah knew because they are cousins to Mary. But these are the first men on the day that Jesus is born to get the word, to get the message that the Savior is now here. I want to read this to you, and you can follow along with me on the screens. If you have a Bible in your hands, I always bring my Bible with me. Uh, if you're old school, the stuff inside this book is called paper. They have it on display in the Smithsonian Institute, downtown D.C. Or if you like to read the Bible on your phone, if you have an iPhone, you can go ahead and pull out your, your app and you can read the Bible there. If you have a Samsung device, just throw it away and get you an iPhone for Christmas and you'll be walking in the Holy Spirit and His will for your life and God will set you free and give you a brand new purpose in your life. If you didn't bring one with you today at every campus, watching online or on television, you can follow along with me. Let's read this together. I'll pause at a few spots and show you some things and hopefully teach you some things that will encourage you and get you ready for what God wants to use you for, not just this week leading up to Christmas, but also for the rest of your life. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and following. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then... An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, there are some things that terrify me. I'm a six foot three, 240 pound, grown 45 year old man, but there are some things I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of a math problem. The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Math is confusing, so math came from the devil, which makes it satanic, which means it's against my religious convictions. You know where I'm going with this. I am terrified of spiders. There are people that have pet spiders. God loves you too. I don't know how, but he does. I am terrified of clowns. They freak me out. I saw that movie called It when I was a kid. And I'm pretty sure that clowns eat children. I'm just telling you, I'm terrified of clowns. And finally, I'm terrified of cilantro. It tastes like rotten soap. And I want to punch people in the face when they ask me if I want cilantro. I'm like, I'm a Christian. No, I don't. Why were they terrified? Well, let me tell you why the shepherds were terrified. First of all, these are some, these are some rough and tough guys. These are blue-collar, hard-working guys. Calluses on their hands. They live outdoors. They work in fields they, they've seen it all, but in the middle of the night, on, on the night that Jesus is born, angels appear to them, and they're terrified. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, when angels appear to people, the very first thing they have to say to them is, do not be afraid, there's a reason for that, because angels are freaking scary, that's why. These, these guys are like Navy SEALs meet MMA fighters on steroids, and they're not like the angels that we, you know, imagine little babies with feathered hair, the Norwegian babies with blue hair and soft little pudgy. No, these guys are like, they were here to do business. And they tell the shepherds, don't, don't be afraid. Why? Why should they not be afraid? Well, the angels tell the shepherds the reason. But the angel said to them, verse 10, don't be afraid for look. I proclaim to you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. Today, a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. Now, I want to draw your attention to some very important parts of this passage of Scripture because we've probably all heard this before. Some of you may have read this if you grew up in church. You may have heard your pastor or your priest read it. Maybe you went to Sunday school and you read about it. Or if you're like me and you grew up in the 1900s, you may remember that on CBS every year, there was the trifecta of TV programs every Christmas season. There was the Abominable Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and the Charlie Brown Christmas Special. Come on, somebody. 
So, so you probably remember this story, but I want to show you some things that you may have missed, even if you've heard the story before. First of all, when the angel tells them not to be afraid, the reason they don't have to be afraid is because there's some good news to share, but the good news is not only for the world, it's also for the shepherds. He says, I am proclaiming great joy that will be for all the people. This was scandalous because up until this point, the good news had only been for one ethnic group, the Jews. Only one people group, the Israelites. But now everything changes. Now the story of redemption, the story of salvation, the story of how God came to the human race to love them and save them isn't just for the Jews anymore. It's for everybody else. And here we are, 2,000 years later, and I'm preaching in a church, and I'm looking out, and I see white people sitting beside black people, sitting beside Asian people, sitting beside Latino people, sitting beside mixed-race mocha, honey, brown, sugar, chocolate people. And I am praising God today that the good news is for all people. It ain't just for white people. It's not just for Republicans. It's not just for Redskin fans. It's not just for Southern Baptists or Roman Catholics. It's for everybody. Praise God. And it's also, I love this, it's for the shepherds. Because this Messiah, the Lord, was born for you. So church is for everybody, but church is also for you. Don't get so overwhelmed with the everybody that Jesus is for that you forget he's for you. He wants to know you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to use you. He has a destiny and a purpose for you. You might be the richest CEO in your life town or maybe even your state, or you might be right at the poverty level working three jobs just to make ends meet. Jesus is for you. You might be that mom raising three kids at home and people ask you that dumb question, so what do you do for a living? (laughs) And you might want to say, I basically feed my kids goldfish and mac and cheese and I had not had a shower in a week and I haven't had a salad in a month. That's what I do for a living, thank you very much. Jesus is for you. you. You have no idea, I have no idea until we go to the scripture how much potential God has invested in us. And, and this story is proof that God entrusts the good news of the gospel to ordinary people like you and like me. So the angel says, don't don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. And and today, a Savior is born in the city of David. The city of David, we all know, is called Bethlehem. In Hebrew, that means house of bread. Bethlehem, bread house, the place where bread is is made. That's significant as we're going to see in just a moment. Verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Jesus is lying in a feeding trough. He's born in a cave, probably a cave that's been turned into a manger, a stable, a barn where animals live. Because you know the story, there was no room for them in the Holiday Inn Express, um, their, their Marriott Rewards card uh, d- did not get them into the Courtyard Marriott. They had to get stuck in a, in a cave, a place where animals live. How ironic that Jesus is laid in a feeding trough. You may have read it before and it uses the word manger. The feeding trough was literally a man-made uh, contraption that they put hay in and feed in to feed animals, to give sustenance to animals. Jesus, who is born in a city called Bethlehem, 
which means the house of bread, will later identify himself with one of his seven I am statements, I am the bread of life. When, when Jesus makes his appearance for the first time into the planet that he created, the creator becomes a part of the creation he created. And where is the first place they lay him down? In a feeding trough to symbolize the fact that we are still receiving spiritual nourishment from the bread of life. Do you see how rich this story is? Jesus will one day be laid in a tomb, right? And they will wrap him up in grave clothes. And one day, three days after he is crucified, they go and they find the tomb empty and the grave clothes laying there folded up where his body was laid. How ironic that when Jesus is born, they find him wrapped snugly in cloth. Well, let's go back to Charlie Brown for a minute. If you ever saw Charlie Brown as a kid, they used the King James Version when they read this Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. And it says, you will find the baby, do you remember, lying in what kind of clothes? Swaddling, Swaddling clothes. Now, we don't ever use that word anymore. It's an old word, but it meant something significant. Shepherds are sent to go find Jesus in a barn where sheep are born and raised and fed. They find him lying in a feeding trough, and he's wrapped tightly in swaddling clothes. Why? Well, when a baby lamb was born in that culture, they would be raised into adulthood, and as a sheep, some of them were born and raised for the purpose of their meat. They were killed and they were cooked and eaten. Some of them were raised for the purpose of their wool. They were sheared and that wool was turned into clothing and blankets. But every once in a while, on occasion, a lamb was born and that lamb was set apart for a very different purpose. According to Jewish law, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And in the Jewish culture, once a year on the Day of Atonement, a lamb was taken to the temple and that lamb was slaughtered. But that lamb had to be a perfect, spotless lamb without blemish. So certain lambs, when they were born, were set aside for the purpose of death. And when these lambs were born, they didn't graze with the other lambs. They didn't go into a pen with the other lambs. They didn't grow up and become a sheep alongside the other sheep. From the moment the sacrificial lamb was born, that lamb was set aside. And that lamb, from the moment it was born, was wrapped up in a special kind of cloth set aside for the sacrificial lamb called swaddling cloths. God is trying to say something. I'm sending my son. He's going to be laying in a feeding trough because his body will be broken for your sin. His blood will be shed for your salvation. And he will be the bread of life that will feed you and give you all the nourishment you need. I'm sending my son not as a prince or a prime minister or a president or a conquering king or a military general or Julius Caesar. I'm sending my son as a helpless baby in a manger. And when he's born, he's going to be wrapped up in the same kind of cloth that they wrap up sacrificial lambs because my son is coming to die, but he's not coming to stay dead. He's coming to die for your sin and be raised to life for your new beginning. Hey, if y'all aren't reading the Bible on a daily basis, you are missing out, y'all. Kind of like vegetarians. You just don't know what you're missing. You know, I'm teasing. Not really. Sorry, not sorry. And it says in verse 13, suddenly there was a multitude of of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Aren't you glad that God's favor isn't fair? Because if we all got what we deserved, <laughs> I promise you none of us would be sitting in church today. God's favor isn't fair. That's why it's called grace. The favor of God now rests on people. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it 
were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, just as they had been told. Amazing to me that of all the people God could have entrusted with the greatest news God ever wanted the world to hear, he picked these guys. They're not seminary trained. They didn't go to Bible college. You didn't walk in their office and see degrees hanging on the wall because these guys didn't have an office. They lived outside. And here's what I want to say. God made a statement about salvation when he sent his messengers to shepherds. When God sent the angels to the shepherds first, God was announcing to the world, I want you to know me. And I'm going to send my own son to you. And I'm going to give you my very best possession, my very best gift to show you how much I love you. God was making a statement. Because shepherds couldn't even go to the temple and make a sacrifice. Do you know why? Shepherds were unclean. Now, I don't just mean they smelled like a middle school boy who hasn't started using deodorant yet. Okay? Because that's unclean. I, what I mean is they were unclean according to Jewish law because they lived outside. They couldn't bathe their bodies regularly. They couldn't wash their hands according to Jewish law. So these shepherds couldn't go to Jerusalem on the day of Passover. These shepherds couldn't take a sacrificial lamb that had been raised and take it and sacrifice it on the day of atonement. They were not allowed into the holy place in the temple because they lived among animals, because they were dirty on the outside. But here's what I love about God. I love this fact that when the shepherds couldn't get to the temple, God decided, I'll just bring the temple to you. When the shepherds had no access to the holy place, God said, I'm going to send some angels and make the place you're working a holy place. Listen to me, Christian. Everywhere you stand is holy ground because you take the power and the presence of God with you into every square inch you possess. Let me tell you what your mission field is. I'm 45. I've been 44 countries now in my life. I've Praise God, I'm going to get to preach to more people than I ever dreamed in a couple of weeks in Uganda. 30 million on TV. I'm praying for 30,000 salvations. Pray with me for that. Believe with me for that. Join your faith with mine on that. I'm going to believe that. But here's the thing. People ask me all the time, where do you feel called? Let me tell you where I feel called. Right where I'm standing. Because wherever I'm standing is my mission field. You might be a school teacher. That's your mission field. You might be a, a corporate attorney. That's your mission field. You might commute into D.C. or to Richmond. You work in the military or you're a contractor. That's your mission field. Stay-at-home dad, your kids are your mission field. Stay-at-home mom, your kids are your mission field. When I come to preach for you, you're my mission field. Whoever I meet today on the way home, that's my mission field. I love the fact that God chose shepherds first. Just plain, ordinary people. Hey, you know what? That's all God's ever used. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. You ready? Don't tell anybody I'm telling you this because it's top secret. Okay? It's a free of charge. The reason why God only uses ordinary people is because that's all he's got to work with. Every single one of us is ordinary compared to God. So if you feel ordinary... I'm just an ordinary executive. I'm just an ordinary administrator. I'm just an ordinary administrative assistant. I'm just an ordinary teacher. I'm just an ordinary coach. I'm just an ordinary mailman. I'm just an ordinary... No. You're exactly who God trusts with the message of his gospel. The last people we would expect are the first people God picks. God's done this all throughout the scripture. He always picks the least likely. I mean, think about the most popular shepherd in the Bible, David. David is 14 years old. He's the youngest son, not the oldest son. Did you know that in that culture, when a family delivered their firstborn son, 
It was such a big deal to have a boy that when the firstborn son was born, all of the lineage, all of the inheritance, all of the bloodline would be traced through that firstborn son. Families would pay money to professional singers and musicians to herald the announcement that a baby boy had been born. They would literally walk around villages and towns and cities, and they would sing and announce that a family had had a firstborn son. But when God sent his firstborn, his only begotten son, into the world, God didn't have to pay anybody. God didn't have to pull out the debit card. God didn't have to go digging around in the couch cushions to find some loose change because God commands every angel army in the universe, and God wanted his son to be worshipped the moment he entered the world. So he sent angels to declare his glory, and then he sent shepherds to go and worship him in a barn. The last people we would expect, a little 14-year-old shepherd boy born in Bethlehem named David, taking care of sheep a day's journey away, and all of his older brothers are thinking, I'm certainly going to be the next king of Israel. And the prophet said, God rejects everyone that man expects. So if you feel like the least likely person that God could use, you're the most likely person for God to use. Because he loves to pick first the last people we would expect because God sees ordinary people with extraordinary purpose. God doesn't look down on earth and see superstars. I mean, because when you're God, what impresses you? For real. If if you're God, what, what impresses you? Hey, God, look what I did. I wrote a poem. God's like, I wrote the Bible. (laughs) God, I I wrote a song. And God's like, I taught birds how to sing. (laughs) Hey, God, I'm I'm a comedian. I came up with a good joke. Want to hear it? Knock, knock. God's like, I know. I know who's there. I've already been there. I know who's there. Like, you, you cannot impress God because God doesn't want to be impressed with you. He loves you. You've got nothing to prove and no one to impress. You do you for the glory of God. He has given you unique abilities. Let me tell you what else he's given you. He's given you unique relationships. I was thinking about the guy that delivers my UPS packages. He meets infinitely more people than I meet on a weekly basis. And he has the ability to influence every single one of them. Some of you this week are going to have access to people that don't even know there is a God who cares about them. And if they would just come to a service and experience Christmas here at LifePoint, they would have an opportunity to hear how much Jesus does love them, and they will be told in simple ways how they can connect with God, receive Christ as Savior, and be a changed new person. But you, you don't feel like you can do anything because you feel ordinary. Embrace that and realize that you have extraordinary purpose because you're made in God's image. If God trusted the shepherds to be the first ones to carry this message, he trusts you. Now, one final thought. The first to worship and the first to witness are those that are willing to work. I'm reading this passage in Luke 2, and I'm thinking, of all the people that met Jesus on the day he was born, the very first Christmas, the first human beings to ever worship Jesus were these shepherds. The Bible says they proclaimed it loudly. They praised him as they left that manger, that little cave, that that little feeding trough where this baby has been born. They are rejoicing and celebrating what they've just seen. God entrusted the first people to worship his son with this amazing opportunity, but they're the last people we would have ever expected. But they're not just the first people to worship Jesus. They're the first people to witness. As they leave... Luke 2 says they told everybody. Because when you, come on, y'all, when something good happens to you, you can't shut up about it. This year, just as an example, this past summer, a friend of mine, for my 30-year anniversary in ministry, gave me a truck. It ain't just a truck, y'all. It's a Ford F-250, four by four, platinum edition, leather seats, four door, tow package, independent climate control. And I tell people when they see me driving this, this new truck, they're like, wow, I like your truck. You know what I do? I witness. 
Let me tell you how this happened. My friend that I've known for 23 years surprised me with his truck. He wanted to give it to me as a gift. I didn't ask for it, I didn't expect it. But he wanted to give it to me as a gift because he loves Jesus and he's generous. I'm gonna tell that story. When the shepherds go see the baby Jesus and realize this is the Messiah of the world and also for us, they could not shut up about it. It just spilled out of them. We call that overflow. You know who gets to witness and worship though? People who are willing to work. Why did God pick shepherds? Well, I don't know all the reasons, but I'm just guessing a few. Shepherds knew what it was like to show up early and stay late. They lived outside. They weathered the elements. They had the heart to care for weaker vessels. That's why they took care of sheep, because sheep are defenseless animals. Shepherds were tough. Shepherds were well-connected. Shepherds had networks. But if you look at the landscape of first century Israel, <laughs> nobody worked harder than shepherds. God entrusted the worship of his son and the witness of the good news to ordinary people who were willing to work. And if you're willing to work, God's ready to bless. If you're willing to work, God is ready to bless. And I got news for you. If you're not willing to work, God's going to move on to somebody who is. And they're going to get to receive the blessing of working hard and watching God pour out abundance on their life. And let me tell you the abundance I'm talking about. I'm not talking about money or a new house or a new car. I'm talking about the joy of bringing somebody with you to a Christmas worship experience and watching them pray to receive Christ and walking with them as they become a disciple of Jesus. There is nothing better than that. And if you are willing to work, God is willing to bless. And I'm wondering if God's putting names on your heart right now, the people you can bring with you. I'm wondering right now, watching online, watching on television at all of our campuses, who is it that God wants you to work on this week? Maybe you'll have to invite them three times. Don't stop after the first one. If you ask them one time and they say no, take a cue from my playbook. When I was in high school, I called a girl named Erin from my chemistry class. I said, will you go out with me? She said, who is this? I said, this is Clayton King from chemistry. She goes, oh, no thank you. I said, well, do you have a sister? Is she older than 15? And if so, can you put her on the phone? Ask again. If you ask one time and they say no, ask again. And if they say no the second time, just remember what Clayton told you three times. Just ask. And then bait them with food. Take them to Waffle House if you need to. Just don't kill them. Don't take them there twice because they'll die if you take them there twice. One time, won't hurt them. Please hammer, don't hurt them, okay? If you're willing to work, God's ready to bless Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would speak a word into the heart of your people right now, that they would realize you've always used ordinary people from the poorest to the richest of every race and color and background to carry your good news to all the people that need it most desperately. With your eyes closed and your hearts open at every campus, every location, online and on television, if you've never trusted Christ, if this message today has stirred something in your soul and you feel like you need to become a Christian. You need to give your life to Jesus. You've heard me talk about the good news. You've heard me encourage Christians to carry that good news, but you don't even believe it yourself. You don't possess it yourself. If you've never repented of your sin and given your life to Jesus, you can do it right now. Romans 10, 13 says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is your moment. So I invite you, if the Spirit of God has drawn you to salvation, to this good news. If you will open your heart and invite Jesus in, he'll say yes, and he'll come in and make you a new person. And he'll love you and he'll give you a brand new life. Pray this if you wanna give your life to Jesus right now. Pray it in your heart quietly to Jesus, not to me, and Jesus will save you and you can begin a relationship with him. He's listening, pray this to him in your heart. Jesus, please save me. Save me from my sin. Save me from my guilt. Rescue me from myself. I believe you love me. I know you died in my place. So I put my faith in you, Jesus. 
I give you my life. I give you control. I'm all yours now. And I'm all in. Hey, with your eyes closed and your hearts open to the Holy Spirit, at every campus online, our TV audience, if you just prayed that prayer to Jesus and you meant it without looking around, would you do one simple thing? Would you raise your hand straight up above your head right now if you just prayed that prayer to Jesus and you meant what you said? Can you raise it up and keep it up for just a few seconds? I want you to raise it high because what you're doing is you are publicly indicating, hey, Jesus, I'm the one. I'm the one who just believed. I'm the one that just prayed. I'm the one that just trusted you. Dozens and dozens and dozens of hands are up right now. Keep your hand up for just another moment. I want you to remember this moment when you connected with Jesus Christ and you responded to his love. You can put your hands down. In just a few moments after I pray, someone's gonna tell you what you can do to take your next step now that you have received Christ into your life. Jesus, we bless your name and give you immediate glory for what you have done in this house today. Thank you that you use ordinary people to do extraordinary things for your glory. And we thank you for everyone that just put their faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.